you'll be able probably to get off your antidepressant medications, but your doctor needs to work with you to get them off, and you'll be saving yourself some money and doing your body a, a total service getting yourself off drugs you don't need. I want to go back to the other aspects of this, which is that there are uh, breast cancer uh, has increased since there's been B12 deficiency noticed in postmenopausal women. B12 is effective with the immune system and autoimmune problems are connected to this B12 deficiency. Can you talk about, first of all, the breast cancer and the B12 deficiency postmenopausal profile of women? Well, B12 is needed for your entire system. It affects, and it's not, you know, the GI, the neurologic system, and the blood system are the major, but affects the immune, the vascular, GI, skeletal, and your um, urinary system. So, when you're B12 deficient, actually your white blood cell count goes down, and that's the ones that fight infection. So people are more prone to get infections or not heal properly. They've even found studies where people who have wounds, like the cubis ulcers, like elderly people, they're B12 deficient, and they do much better when you, when you replace what they're deficient of. So if it affects your immune system, you're more apt to be able to, they've, just, they've done studies where they have found people who have cancer are B12 deficient. The other thing with cancer that they have to realize too is that anytime people get chemotherapy or radiation therapy, that destructs your B12. You need B12 for your blood. And the traditional thing when they think of B12 is pernicious anemia. It affects the bone marrow. And you need B12 for life. You know, blood gives you life. Um, that in itself, they're finding a lot of cancer patients that are B12 deficient. In fact, we're finding a, um, they're going to be doing a study on patients receiving chemotherapy and radiation where, in fact, where I work, there is one group that they're finding so many people are B12 deficient that, that have going through chemotherapy. Of course it does because it just, you know, it affects the bone marrow, so you need more B12. And sometimes um, oncologists, they'll give you, they give B12 in a, like a multivitamin cocktail they give intravenously, but if they're using just six micrograms of B12, that's not enough. What we found is cancer patients need a lot more B12 to replace what the chemo and radiation is doing to their body, and they do much better. In fact, a, a true story is uh, I have a hairdresser, who has colon cancer, stage four, and she has had this for four years, but she had su surgery on her um, colon, removed it, was good for two years, came back, and now her colon is clean, but she has it in her lungs, like 17 different nodules, and some in her liver. They can't remove them because they're too hard to get to, but it's stage four, so it's through her, her, her system. She's been on chemotherapy for two years, Oh never received God. a blood transfusion or platelet transfusion. I give her with the permission of her oncologist because she swears, and it does, it, I give her an, a B12 injection every week. She gets a, a B12 injection, and now she's learned how to do it herself. So weekly she gets hydroxycobalamin, and it just improves her energy. She's able to work, and it's two years. Her tumors aren't shrinking, but they're not growing, which is good, and she still gets her chemo. The chemo really wipes her out. But when you think about this, can you imagine the amount of money we could save? A lot of cancer patients are on Procrit, which is very expensive. Um, it's an anemia agent to help anemia, which cancer patients get, renal patients get. And it probably costs like about $4,000, like a three, four months treatment of it. If you could use B12 to add to that, and do just as well, if not better, that would make more sense financially for this country. They need to do studies on that. Plus, if you give a person Procrit to help their anemia, and they truly have a B12 deficiency, and that's why they're really anemic, not only are you kind of fictitiously somewhat elevating their, you know, helping their anemia, but you're allowing that neurological, that myelin to be destroyed over time, and that's why they're sickly and they don't feel good, et cetera. So this is a huge another area of research that they need to start documenting new stuff and use it in cancer patients. I have a dear friend who just went through six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, and they don't even know if she has cancer. <laughs> 
lovely. Um, and I have watched her almost be destroyed, almost at the destruction level from the treatment itself. And she has zero energy. She's violently sick. And she can't eat. She has to take Insure through a feeding tube through her stomach. Can't eat, can't drink water. It is so sad. And I have her getting hyperbaric oxygen treatments right now to get rid of the radiation sickness that she has from the treatment. But it sounds like the B12 would be incredible for her, yeah, too. Yeah, what she should, do, she should do is definitely get, get a baseline B12. Where am I at? And we kind of advocate now not even doing the MMA homocysteine because those are all over and you just use a different range. But definitely get a baseline B12, even if, say, she was fine, okay? Because sometimes they, they may have given her, like, a B12 um, injection after a treatment. Who knows? Because each, you know, I think they're starting to learn about I'm hearing more oncology centers going, hey, they're starting to do the B12. In fact, my, my, they have learned through my hairdresser that she now hears the nurses at the oncology center saying to the patient, did you get your B12 shot? So it's kind of like they're, they're trying something on their own. But she should get a baseline, and then she should get weekly injections. Doing it once a month, and this is our... How strength. many injections in a week? Huh? How many injections? Well, if she's deficient, if she's deficient, what she really should get is she should get an injection every other day for six injections. So three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Thereafter, get injection once a week. Got it. And see how she improves. Okay. You know, the, the beauty of B12 also, it's non-toxic. You, and it's excreted, you're not going to retain it. Like there's certain fat-soluble vitamins you can get too much. You'll urinate out what you don't need. Um, to give you an example how safe it is, we give 1,000 micrograms, which also equals a milligram. So people think, oh, my God, 1,000 micrograms, oh, that's so much. It's, it's not. Because we know for safety we can use a certain form of B12 called hydroxocobalamin. We use it for cyanide poisoning. They've been using it in Europe for decades or maybe like 10 years. We finally introduced it in the U.S. probably, I think it was 2007 or 8, that we now use it as a treatment for cyanide poisoning. And what they do, they give the patient five grams of B12 mixed in a solution of saline, and they infuse it in the patient over 15 minutes. Five grams equals 5,000 times the amount of one B12 injection, the 1,000 micrograms. It's 5,000 times that amount, infusing it intravenously in 15 minutes. So when people go, oh, my God, like, you know, if you're getting injection once a week, they think, oh, it's too much. It's not too much. You, you, you you know what I mean? That just shows you the safety of the, of the drug. Not saying that you should give somebody 5,000. That's for a totally different reason. Cyanide poisoning, if someone tried to kill someone or industrial accidents, what it does is when you give B12 through the body, the hydroxocobalamin binds with the cyanide, and it creates cyanocobalamin, and that's what you excrete out. It's so complex, isn't it? Yeah, but, but, it's, but it's very safe, so you don't have to, to worry. And, and the, the treatment protocol in medical textbooks, for decades, when someone is B12 deficient, they usually give a shot daily. And we say every other day just so people don't, they think, like, oh, if a shot is, is, is hurting too much. And it really doesn't hurt much. You could give it daily times six or seven or every other day so you get that initial seven, six or seven in, and then you can go weekly. Some people, for maintenance, do well on bimonthly, like every two weeks a shot. Other people do well on weekly shots. Now, the literature, they always say you give a B12 injection once a month. If you talk to people who truly have B12 deficiency, they know week three they are dragging. That makes no sense to make them wait a month, especially when they can self-administer it. It's not toxic. It's safe. And it's, it's kind of like if you were to take a pill once a month. It, it makes no sense. So we have to really look back in the 40s and 50s when they wrote protocols for B12 deficiency, because people actually died in the early 1900s. That's why they called it a deadly anemia. Eventually, they had like, severe neurological destruction, and then they died from the severe anemia, and they died. In fact, people probably don't know this, but Alexander Graham Bell died of, of pernicious anemia in the early 20s. And so did that Annie Oakley. She died from pernicious anemia. So people actually died from it. If we can, I wanted to go back to the issue of being tested, that everybody should be tested to know your levels. Very much now people are finely tuned into getting their D levels tested. 
you know, vitamin D levels and vitamin D is so important now and they're realizing that our whole baseline of what we need is totally different.